Hi, welcome back, everybody. We're joined by Christina Lumazo, uh, the blockchain lead at the UNICEF Crypto Fund. Thanks for joining us today, Christina. Hi, Christina. It's nice to see your face again, although no lunch this time. <laughs> Christina, I'm really excited to hear about what you've learned so far at the Crypto Fund. When you've been giving teams in all these different countries, Bitcoin or Ether, when did you see that it actually gave them real value? And when did it actually just create more hassle for the sake of tech buzzwords? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's been a really long journey for UNICEF to actually get to the point of being able to accept crypto as cryptocurrency and then make these early stage investments into uh, startups around the world who are working on open source technology, ultimately to benefit children. And so that took us about a two year process to get to the point to be able to do that. Um, and lots of lessons learned in this prototype crypto fund that we launched last October. Um, one would be that we still need to follow the same processes and procedures that we typically do. Um, so there's still you know, agreements that we need to sign. There's still processes we follow and obviously setting up the technology. Um, so that's been a big lesson for UNICEF as a whole. But what it's allowed us to do is have a conversation around a digitally financed future and what that looks like. So not about a particular cryptocurrency, but how does UNICEF as an organization that works in over 190 countries to deliver programs to young people and mothers, how do we actually work with a digital currency? And um, one of the things that you can imagine, and I've heard other speakers talk about today, is the difficulty of actual accessibility and getting companies on board to the crypto ecosystem. And um, so while we have set up the infrastructure and the processes and our first three investments for the crypto fund were with blockchain companies, so they were a little more familiar with how crypto works. Our next round of investments that we're just in the process of finalizing right now are with some non-blockchain companies. And so working through those steps of how do they get onboarded to the ecosystem in, in an easy way. And I think there's still a lot of progress to be made um, on that front. Gotcha. And in terms of the cryptocurrency you guys are giving them, it's all usually donated to you, right? Has any organization other than the Ethereum Foundation given the UNICEF Crypto Fund any Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, to date, we have received both Bitcoin and Ether. Um, even before the crypto fund was launched, UNICEF France, which is one of our national committees that does fundraising, accepted Bitcoin as early as September 2018. Now, we are still looking for a uh, kind of an anchor donor for the crypto fund as it pertains to Bitcoin. So if anyone's interested, we're always looking to hear from you. Um, but I would say that we've had outreach from two different kind of partners. One is uh, those who are looking to financially contribute, so either in Bitcoin or Ether. But we also have technical collaborations. So since launching the crypto fund, one of the announcements that we've made is with the Ethereum Classic Lab, them contributing $250,000 to our venture fund, which makes investments in US dollars, and then $750,000 to follow on investments to those companies who might be part of our venture fund or our crypto fund. And then an example of a technical collaboration uh, would be, for example, with UNICEF France, one of their first crypto campaigns was actually called Game Changers. And this is where gamers could lend their um, gamer console processing power to actually mine crypto. And the crypto that they were mining would go towards UNICEF. And in that case, specifically at that time, it was helping the Syrian relief uh, efforts at that time. Ooh. Christina, I'm really excited about what you're working on, and I think it's really progressive, but I'm curious about the impact and precedent it's setting outside of blockchain specific projects. Like, are you seeing this translate into how other projects that might look for UNICEF support are changing the way that their business model might work or that their project viability might work in response to what UNICEF is working on? Yeah, I think it's a great question because, as I mentioned, the first round that we did with the crypto fund, that was really with three companies who are blockchain companies. And in the most recent round of funding, we're looking at companies who uh, may not be blockchain specific. And so these are companies who might be working on a, a drone solution or an XR VR or some type of data science. And as you can imagine, a lot of the startups that we work on right now have shifted their solution to actually focus on COVID response. Um, and so what we see is that they still need to keep working on their solutions, whether that be the path that they set out before or this reconfiguring for what they're working on in response to COVID. And they're looking for different funding sources. So whether that be USD or whether that be in Bitcoin or Ether, the startups are really willing to actually um, understand and work through the process of, 
of what it means to actually accept cryptocurrency. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm also really curious to, because I know that you guys work a lot with the Ethereum Foundation. Um, Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin said on an interview last week that he would like to see Ether or could see Ether as a global reserve currency. I'm curious to hear from you as someone who works with teams and governments really all around the world, if you think that's a realistic proposition. Do you think that Ether could ever be a global reserve currency? I think that's a tough question to answer in terms of whether it could be a reserve currency. I think what we've seen from our experience is that we're already living in this world of a digitally financed future. And I would go to the example of Kenya where M-Pesa, almost 50% of Kenya's GDP is transacted through M-Pesa already. And that's some version of a digital currency being transacted. One of the things though that this brings is that, and it's been alluded to in previous talks, is that you need to have some way to actually access these types of platforms. So if we're talking about a reserve currency, that means that generally this currency is used in the masses and to use a cryptocurrency or a digital currency, one of the things that is necessary is connectivity. And currently half of humanity doesn't have internet access. And that's a, a huge issue because you want to give people options, information, opportunity, and choice. And so one of the projects that the UNICEF innovation team has been recently working on in conjunction with ITU, which is uh, one of our UN agencies, is actually to set up universal connectivity. And I bring this up specifically because having universal connectivity really sets up the base to then have so many applications like a digital currency. Um, one of the things that our team, our blockchain team specifically is working on as it relates to Giga is how could you use cryptocurrency, for example, to make a donation or to pay for connectivity in a specific region? And then an internet service provider would know that the funding is available to pay for that connectivity. And then could we use something like um, a probe or a Chrome extension or something like that to actually track the connectivity in each of those schools or the community to know that when you're paying for connectivity, it's actually being delivered and using blockchain as this transparent immutable ledger to actually track the connectivity speed and then leveraging smart contracts to do some of the relationship management between the actual connectivity speed and the payment and things like that to really streamline the end to end process from payment through to vendor management. And so that's one of the bigger initiatives called Giga that our team is looking at from multiple lenses, not just a blockchain lens. Gotcha. And uh, Lucy, was there anything else in general? I know that you guys have both worked in areas of low connectivity that you think is important for us to keep in mind when we think about the UNICEF crypto fund. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, Christina hits the nail on the head on the accessibility front. And for us, it's really understanding that edge cases matter and that you maybe want to start designing edge cases and then work your way towards mainstream that actually makes solutions a lot more feasible. And I think, um, Christina, I have tons of respect for what you're working on. And I'm uh, curious to hear maybe a little bit about um, like what you've seen in terms of initiatives that are have already reached the hands of children, you know, as UNICEF's prime directive. Yeah, so we've been really excited to see, uh, we had a group of six blockchain companies who joined our cohort back in December 2018, and they're typically with us for a one-year investment period. And some of those startups, for example, were doing vaccine supply chain, so tracking actually the entire life cycle of vaccines, or doing things like digital prescriptions in Mexico, and that's a startup called Prescripto. Um, and so it's been great to see the progress that these startups have made over the one year period that they've been with our venture fund and our crypto fund receiving both US dollars and crypto. Um, and it would be really exciting to see the next cohort of companies that we expect to announce really shortly. So please stay tuned. You guys have given me both so much to think about. Thank you very, very much for joining. Next up, we're gonna have Camila Russo and my coworker Brad taking a deep dive into markets. So be sure to stay tuned everybody and enjoy the rest of Consensus Distributed.